This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. Okay, and we are... Back. Today, we have a very special guest for a very special Dark Room episode. For people who um, have been kind of following along with us, you know we've got two broad categories of shows. We've got our main show where we do, you know, a well-researched deep dive into, into a subject like uh, recent ones are Robert Aikman, uh, Roberto Bolaño, various other Roberts, H.P. Uh, <laughs> Lovecraft, uh, uh, William Faulkner, Sarah Kane, James Joyce, Pamela Coleman-Smith, uh, many and many others, many more to come. Um, but in the, for these Dark Room episodes, we like to bring in somebody who is a little more knowledgeable, uh, sometimes just kind of differently knowledgeable um, about a subject that we have covered in the past. And today we're going to talk about... Um, G.I. Gurdjieff, which is the subject of one of our earliest episodes, like over a year ago now, Kevin, if you can imagine that. Uh, I do. I remember. Of- yes. And I, I yeah. since then, I have been in a spiritual battle with the moon, trying to hold yes. on to the parts of my soul <laughs> yeah, you- that the moon's trying to take away. I don't want to discuss yeah, how it. How are you doing with that? I don't want to talk discuss it. it. No, nope, I don't want to talk fair. about it. And uh, <laughs> I fair. do think listening back to that episode, because it can be quite cringe to listen to your old stuff. I do yeah. feel like the Gurdjieff episode was a little because Gurdjieff came before Kubrick, correct? Yeah, I believe yeah, so. Like fourth episode. I, I feel like I feel like the Gurdjieff episode was a little baby step toward the the realization of what art yeah. of darkness is. Yeah, yeah, lots of fun. One thing mm-hmm. that I noticed it was it's a good episode for people to listen back. One thing I noticed is we were very concerned about time, and the episodes were like an hour and a half long, <laughs> so we would go on. To <laughs> and do- now we now we've realized <laughs> yeah. that the core episodes all need to be three three hours long, yes. two parters. People yeah. want two parters. People want yeah. nine hours of Lovecraft. I don't know why, but that's what they want. Yeah, they do. It's true. Hey, they have to, get to, have to give the people what they want at least a little That's bit. That's right. So um, I, I've been thinking for months, but you know, who could who could we get on to to uh, to talk about Gurdjieff? I'm no expert, Kevin. You know more about Gurdjieff than I do. Um, but I thought, you know, who who could we get on? Who could it be? And then it struck me that we should try to get the host of one of my absolute favorite podcasts on. And that is the great James Ellis. And the podcast is, of course, the Hermetics podcast. Um, uh, I don't want to j- say he's just a podcast host, even though it is one of the top-notch podcasts out there. So people, please listen to that if you don't already. Um, but he's also the author of uh, now three books, uh, mm-hmm. Methodology of Possession on the Philosophy of Nick Land, uh, Exiting Modernity, which is a uh, I believe James, correct me if I'm wrong. It's that's collected essays that sort of fit under that title. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Humanity, yeah. Fair to say. Yeah. And most recently, um, uh, his novel, be not afraid, um, which I, I actually just bought today and I'm looking mm. forward to reading it. So I, I can't oh. say anything about it, but I'm definitely looking forward to checking it out. Um, so, I mean, first James, Thank you so much for coming on. We really do appreciate your time. And this is, we're, we're both pretty excited about this. No, so, it's, it's, uh, so thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. It's really exciting. I don't, I don't get a chance to really talk about Gurdjieff all that much. I mean, I read Gurdjieff all the time. He's the one mm. that's stuck. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I was super excited that you asked me because I don't get, I, you know, you don't get opportunities to talk about this stuff. Right, right. And the one thing, I mean, one thing we should say about the, Her- the Hermetics podcast, because I think this sort of relates is, I mean, you're the, the sort of main thrust of the show, I guess, is you have interviews with a variety of people on a variety of topics. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you've had some of the big names in this sort of niche, not even niche anymore, right? Curtis Yarvin and Nick Land and things. <laughs> um, but then you also have, uh, a, a, you know, interviews with people who've written books on Gurdjieff. Um, mm-hmm. And then you have a series which I recommend to people um, that is just you sort of 
explicating the teachings of Gurdjieff. Is that fair yeah. to call it? Say yeah, it I mean, that, 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 that uh, for various reasons, for one main reason, um, that series is now sort of tucked away. So only people who have the links can mm-hmm. uh, find it. Um, I'll probably make it public again and do some more. Uh, but there's, um, you guys will probably understand it. There's something about not talking about the work that's a difficulty, right? So it's at what mm-hmm. extent can you talk about it publicly and what, how far can you divulge inner experience and is that even possible and things like that. So yeah, those, 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 uh, I mean, we'll probably get into this, but those talks were really, um, I, I did them because there's so many elements to go, Jeff's thinking and sort of to build it up block by block by block. And even though Gurdjieff said, look, I leave you Beelzebub's tales, use that as your teacher. I don't think it's a great starting place. Like I don't think unless you've, <laughs> I don't think unless you've read the other stuff in like in search of the miraculous, you're, you're just not going to, I don't see what he really meant by that. And people always forget that, you know, he said, all right, all the newcomers use, use Beelzebub's tales uh, as yeah. your guide. Right. But it's like, he, I don't know. He must've not forgot this. But I always think, but hang on, all the people who at first read from Beelzebub's Tales would have been his students. So they would have already known the teaching, right? So it's like, you, you need a bit of both, I think. Um, so yeah, and, and, and a lot of people tend to do this thing with Gurdjieff, which a lot of people do with a lot of spiritual teachers. They talk about something and then they, they bring in, they're like, oh, and this is also like Rudolf Steiner. And it's like, just, I wanted to do talks that were like, seriously, just, Let's just look at Gurdjieff on his own merit. Like there's enough there. Um, yeah, I think, I think I did about seven or eight of them and yeah, they're now hidden away. I might bring them back. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, no, no, they're, they're great. And that was, uh, I mean, it's a subject that I've delved into a little bit. Um, and those were, those were great listens. So, you mm-hmm. know, when you bring them back, but the people can still, there's still, if you're a paid still subscriber. Available. Yeah. If yes, you're a paid subscriber, you got access to them. Yeah. And yeah. Hey, you put the work in, man. So like, Yes, <laughs> people should people should pay for it. I know it's 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 everything's you free gotta, now, well, this, so uh, this is a Grigifin, value to that too. But this is a Grigifin axiom: uh, mm, people exactly. don't value what they don't pay for. Exactly. And he would yeah. uh, p- certain people would give him a hard time about this. Mm. Uh, well, why are you making your students pay for this knowledge? And that's what he said. And he's right. right. The great irony of that, though, is is after the fact when they looked into it, it really was. Uh, not many students were paying all that much. It was sort of like mm-hmm. the the power law statistics, which is like ninety seven percent will either pay not that much or just pay enough, like a subscription, or they'll be like just pay boarding. And three percent were were really rich people giving him big amounts of money. So I think you know what he means by that in terms of you don't value what you don't pay for is like, uh, are you actually going to put some um, some form of currency in? So it could be monetary, in which case you got skin in the game, mm-hmm. but it could also be time, effort. You know, he, he's just saying like. You, you need to put something in, otherwise you're not going to value it. You know? I don't, and he certainly didn't like people just just being there and standing around. I mean, he found ways to make make yeah. the uh, the half the half ass people go away. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, this is this is a kind of an embedded. It, it, it's not an intellectual pursuit, even though you know there's a sort of an intellectual aspect to it, right? I mean, Gurdjieff, it's. He's got the, he's got the dance stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I mean, that's what the fourth way is sort of about, right. Is, I mean, kind of bringing the physical, uh, integrating multiple lines of, of human activity or human, you know, perspectives. Um, so yeah, I think my take on it was you don't respect what you don't pay for. I mean, that could be the sweat of your brow. That could be, Mm -hmm. um, just a physical exhaustion, Um, you know, and I know that's kind of true in my life that, that the stuff that you work, you know, you, you sacrifice the most for ends up being the most rewarding. So why would it be? It doesn't cost you anything to retweet at art of dark pod. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) That's true. Well, he, he, James, hang on, hang on, Brett. He used the metaphor of a meal for his system. The, he, you know, he, he talked about the Enneagram and the sort of shocks and the octagonal shocks that you would make. And he, he applied it to everything. It was this sort of totalizing way of trying to understand how it's almost alchemy in a, in a way, how the base material becomes, you know, gold. And he just used a meal as a, as a metaphor for that. Um, yes, go on, Brett. Oh, I, before we get too deep into the, I, I want to give James 
uh, an opportunity to, can you tell us a little bit about your latest book, maybe, uh, Be Not Afraid? Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's uh, a fictionalized version of my conversion to, I would say Christianity, even though I did convert to Catholicism specifically, I mean, you could say Christianity because the book itself isn't specifically, there's a couple of hints that, that I'm more Catholic, definitely in, in, well, I am Catholic, but there's more, there's a couple of subtle hints, but really it's about, it's a fictionalized story of the internal process of a sort of a modern nihilist going, you know, finding Christ. Um, And that's, it's a fairly simple book and it's, it has one purpose, which is for young men and women who are specifically Western to have a, uh, a sort of emotional shock and have something that I think once you get to the point where you're, you're lost and you, you realize you're lost Many people in the West tend to double down and just go more towards the material, um, more mm-hmm. towards pleasure and hedonism. And I think it's for a book mm-hmm. for people who are like, okay, I'm lost, I need something, and, and it's just there for that. And um, yeah, I don't want to drum it up all, 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 all that okay. much. There's, I do say in the start of it that Morris Nichol was a big influence uh, on the book, you know, one of Gurdjieff's students, and the, and the Gurdjieffian that I read the most is is Morris Nichol. And uh, there's there's a there's some... For, for those that know Gurdjieff, there's some subtle hints in there, definitely. Um, well, and, okay. and of course, there's no, uh, uh, what's the word? Well, Gurdjieff described his system as esoteric Christianity. So there's no conflict here. I think some people maybe look at Gurdjieff and sort of bucket him in the new age. If you don't really know what you're looking at, uh, he kind of gets thrown into that funky self-help corner. <laughs> and then, of course, once you, once you really dig in, uh, there, yeah, there's no conflict there. Mm, yeah, I mean, and, th- and this is a big thing for me. I mean, for, on the one hand, he did call it esoteric Christianity. On the other hand, in relation to, even though he was Orthodox himself, in relation to Orthodox Christianity and I would say Catholic Christianity as well, I do think there's things which are uh, some some more hardline people would say they're heretical. I mean, there's po- points earlier on in his life where he's on about Christ being part of the SNs, uh, which would imply, uh, what's it called? Nestorianism, where Christ, you know, Christ is just this prophet sort of thing. Mm, I've probably mm. got the wrong name for it there, but, you know, and, and there isn't this divine thing. But I think later on, for instance, you have the six saints in um, Beelzebub's Tales, and actually you'll notice that, the, you know, Saint Lama, Saint Buddha, etc. And actually he does say that Christ is like the, the only one that's divine. So I think his, his, his appreciation, his understanding of Christianity does change through the years. Um, but yeah, it is esoteric Christianity. And one of the unfortunate things, really, uh, there's really the best, the best book on this is um, Ion Corleano's Eros and Magic in the Renaissance, where he basically says that uh, during the Protestant Reformation, what happened was the Protest- Protestants were stripping Catholicism and Christianity of the sacraments and all the, the higher spiritual mystical elements. Uh, and that was becoming quite popular with, with the people. So what happened there is that Catholicism tried to follow suit. They retained the sacraments, but they equally tried to strip away that like, oh, that's a bit mystical. That's a bit spooky element from it. Right. And this, this, mm. and really what happened after the Reformation then was you had a Christianity that was devoid of anything that was mystical. And I think this really actually stands through to today because it was my experience of Christianity when I was younger from a Church of England school that I found it just a very dry, quote unquote, system uh, that, that was that was told in such a way that it was clear to me when I was younger. I was like, Oh, this is just, this is just extra rules that you're, I don't really understand why I don't understand why you're mm-hmm. tacking this onto the idea of God. All the mysticism was gone. All the spirituality mm, yeah. was gone. And it was like just some vague rules that were added into an assembly. And this is why yeah. I think a lot As of somebody people raised Catholic away. that is true for me. Yeah. And this is why a lot of people have yeah. moved away from Christianity and towards alternative spiritualities, because it seems to them that they're the only places they can actually find, yes. you know, that like, oh, where's these internal practices? Where's this mysticism? And it's really unfortunate that, that I think still, uh, I think we're getting, they're getting a bit better at it, but Christianity tends to tuck away people like Thomas Merton or St. John of the Cross or St. You know, the, the, the stuff where it's this internal Thomas, Campus, Campus, Thomas read. Campus as well, yeah. which was the most popular book. Literally, that's a that's wonderful second to book. the Bible, second to the Bible, the most popular. And book people ever. don't even know it anymore. Yeah, the Imitation of Christ. Yeah, imitation wonderful of Christ. book. Hmm. Yeah, and it's not, and, and this side of things isn't promoted. So, so on the one hand, it is esoteric Christianity, but on the other hand, 
Christianity is just esoteric Christianity. It's just that the esoteric <laughs> right. side has, so Gurdjieff almost <laughs> had to do this thing where it's like, look, this just is Christianity, right? The idea right, of like, right. like, uh, you know, the vertical of the cross of ascension, uh, internal mm-hmm. spiritual growth. I mean, that's in Christianity. Um, mm-hmm. but it was all removed because people got a bit funny about it within the, they, I think what, what, what they tried to do was assimilate spiritual Christianity into the newfound popular secular um, materialism. So it's like, oh, we don't need the above anymore, but we can just have God anyway. And it just, it did damage really to everything. So, yeah. 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 No, completely I, I agree. I, I would completely agree with that. Well, and we were having yeah. a little chat prior to recording here about the literature around the Gurdjieff writing. So Gurdjieff left us three books, uh, uh, Herald of the Coming Good, Meetings with a Remarkable Man, and then, of course, The tales. Doorstopper, and, yeah, yeah, Tales. And, and then um, Life is Real, Only When I Am. Uh, right. And then there, there is, he, I guess he didn't leave these, but there is books of early talks. Mm. There is A Struggle of the Magicians, which is um, a, a ballet, but not many people <laughs> really read that. Uh, but yeah, and then he, you know, he left a lot of talks, and which have been collected right. over the years but he only so he only authorized three books right uh tales remarkable men and life is real when i am uh the herald are coming good which is fine but i don't i think it's just like i think he got rid of it because you see later on that he just develops all that in a better way and he did say take down take this off the- <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a little bit like a <laughs> like an extended pamphlet uh but my my point here is that they're there aren't very many figures of the 20th century about whom more ink has been spilled. And if you're getting into Gurdjieff, there's a book that you and I both agree is a, is a great sort of um, what's, I don't even know what the phrase would be. It's almost like a biography and a description of meeting him. That's a, that's its own genre of Gurdjieff literature. And the one we were talking about James was uh, from the departments. Mm. So we, you were saying that's your favorite, so I think people might like to hear about that. Yeah, it's my, it's my favorite secondary. And I, whenever people are getting started with Gurdjieff, I say to them, you know, uh, a lot of people recommend, everyone goes in search of the miraculous first, right? I have my problems with in search of the miraculous because actually in search of the miraculous only covers Gurdjieff's teaching. He, the, the, the years he's talking about is, I think 19, I hope I'm right on this, 1916, 17, around then, but it's only really a two year period that he's writing about there. And of course, as we know, Gurdjieff was alive until, correct me if I'm wrong, 49. Yeah, 50, something 49. like that, right. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, yeah. the, and the teaching was going up really on until the very last day. I mean, he handed the, 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 ma- the manuscripts for the tales off like three days before his bed, death, as, mm-hmm. if, as if he knew. Um, so I always recommend, like, you need like a theory and you need a biography. So I always recommend Kenneth Walker's um, studies of, study of, a study of Gurdjieff's teachings, which is like out of print, unfortunately, mostly forgotten. But he's, he's just clearer mm-hmm. and... People, the problem that that Uspensky, I think, has in In Search of the Miraculous is I sort of think that people should focus on psychological stuff first. I mean, that's where you're like, wow, this is really amazing. This is groundbreaking. And then suddenly you get halfway into In Search of the Miraculous and he's like, bang, here's the cosmology. And he doesn't do a great <laughs> job explaining it, to be honest with you. Um, but anyway, yeah. yeah. So I'm like, yeah, have a theory book. But also, I, I really have found the the most... Um, help in a way and the most understanding has come from all these biographical accounts of what it is like just to because the work is meant to be lived so you know and it's like well okay read a uh, read a book about people living it and the de Hartman mm-hmm. so uh, Thomas and Olga I think Olga, Thomas and Olga. Mm-hmm. Olga de yeah. Hartman uh, so Thomas was uh, someone who met Gurdjieff uh, in Paris so either St. Petersburg or Paris and he was um Really, really the, the, the go-to guy for Gurdjieff's music. Um, but this really tracks the journey of them meeting Gurdjieff through to their departure from him, which isn't actually all that nice. It's a bit, I think they're a bit at, 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 ends, at odds with each other by the end. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and it just tracks that. And it doesn't really sound like much, but it, it's the one which makes you really think, wow, this Gurdjieff guy is a strange, phenomenal human being. I mean, how could this, 
it reads if if you were to tell the story to someone it reads like something that someone's made up i mean it reads yeah, it's like incredible it reads like the narrative of sort of something like lord of the rings right there's a there's a there's a mm-hmm. long section where gurdjieff is on a horse and cart with uh, thomas de hartman basically delirious with typhoid tied to the cart uh, traveling across mountains and gurdjieff is almost like laying healing hands on him to keep him alive for the whole journey uh, wow. uh, and it's very, in- yeah. If I may, yeah. if I may, they met mm. in St. Petersburg in 1916, mm. and so students of history will understand what that means. And Thomas de Hartmann, he mm. was the court composer to the Tsar, and Gurdjieff oh. saved Gurdjieff saved their lives. Uh, and in this book, you're right; it does read like a mythic story. It's it's just implausible, but these are credible people telling their story. Mm. Uh, and if you're if you're on Spotify right now, where of course you can hear the Art of Darkness pod- podcast and Hermetics, uh, just finish the episode, but then go listen to some, some Hermetics podcast, and then you can pop over. Just type in <laughs> type in DeHartman or Gurdjieff, and you'll find hours and hours of this music that. Uh, Hartman worked with Gurdjieff to sort of transpose and, and bring to life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now is the music, Kevin, or, or either, either of you trying to understand this music. So is, I know how important the sort of embodied characteristics of, of, of Gurdjieff's teachings are and, and, and living it and, and being in a group is sitting there listening to it on Spotify <laughs> the same as uh, uh, hearing a, a quartet, you know, are, are you going to have a, a similar capacity to have the experience that Gurdjieff is, is trying to impress upon you if you're just listening to it on Spotify <laughs> or, or anywhere else, I guess. <laughs> no, no. The answer, no. Is, the answer <laughs> okay. is, I mean, it's this, I mean, one, this is one thing I think about a lot as well. I mean, when you think about, the time that Gurdjieff lived. And I think this was always a struggle for him that he was given that time, though he did accept it and did his best with it. So 18, born 18, 1866 or 1877, we don't actually know. Uh, and it could, <laughs> and there is some proof now that actually the person we were tracking in, uh, that well, they, they were tracking historically in that area might not have been Gurdjieff at all. Um, oh, wow. And that's in... Uh, uh, Paul Beekman Taylor's biography, but um, yeah, and then through to 1949. So really, the, the the world is absolutely turned upside down, turbulent during this time. And one thing I think you know we don't appreciate now in the modern day is that this to hear this music, you, it's, you're not going to be hearing music every day, right? It's not like we can go on Spotify and choose between like probably like what multiple billions of songs that we can just listen to right. at our whim. You know, to be able to go and suddenly this 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 weird. Greco-Armenian mystic is just suddenly playing the most beautiful music you've ever heard. I think it is going to stay with you a lot longer and, and penetrate you a lot deeper because how often are you going to go into you hear music in those days, really? Uh, especially in sort of war-torn Russia or war-torn Paris, etc. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, listening to I mean, listening to on Spotify, you probably if you sit down and you really let it go into you, you're going to have it's going to affect you, but. Hearing it, hearing even just the piano music in person is, is astounding. Mm. It really is. It has. Well, you, didn't he call it objective art, objective music? This idea that it's, and of course, this is maybe a little aggrandizing, but that was that's a word that he threw around quite a lot. Objective, mm. uh, and yeah, it. I've heard it live one time with a string quartet in London during. So I think it was in two thousand and seven or two thousand and eight, and it was in this massive hall and there was a a bad cold going around of course london's very damp and <laughs> and when and when one person gets sick it, 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 you could you know the city is like okay there's a cold going there and it was staggering because people were trying so hard to not to cough not to sniffle and there would be these moments where the music would end and it was almost like psychedelic uh it would, it would put you into a trance they're really truly changing your state through the music, not about entertaining, not about mm-hmm. indulging you or lifting you away. There's, there's, there's actually not romantic at all. Uh, very repetitive and yeah, it really, it does have a legitimate physical effect that you can't quite measure or describe. 
Yeah. Hey, you could do worse on Spotify. I mean, you know, go and sure. go. Listen. Yeah, no, I didn't mean to yeah. dismiss Spotify, but I want no, to sure. go get, get that, some good, that, get know. some good headphones, get some noise canceling yeah. headphones, close your eyes, maybe drink yeah. a little tea and yeah, you can put yourself into a mood for sure. <laughs> yeah. A little Armagnac. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, James, what's your impression of, uh, now that we're on to the, uh, the, li- the liquor, what's your impression of his, uh, <laughs> His famous toast to the idiots. What do you what do you make of that in terms of his his system? I did. I think uh, there's a bit. There's a little bit of writing on this, and I think this is. Um, someone sort of says this is an example of a teacher's single little thing. So this is like, this is Gurdjieff's own little thing that he just like he himself just enjoys doing. Um, <laughs> you know, the toast to the idiots is. I think there's fourteen types of idiot: zigzag idiot, emotional idiot, all these different types of idiot. Which one? <laughs> One is to put themselves within. Uh, there's only ever one person who was uh, declared by Gurdjieff not an idiot who had actually gone beyond that. Uh, and that was Madame de Salzman, uh, ah, who oh. that was why she was also given, uh, you know, handed the keys to the kingdom of Gurdjieff in a way at the end. She was the only non idiot. Um, <laughs> yeah, and this is sort of, I, I mean, one, he liked to use alcohol to basically free people up so they'd be way more honest. Um, uh, but meals, meals for him for him were a huge thing, and it's good to it's good to hear you describe describe his system as food because that food digestion and this meal, this communal idea of meals is is really big for him. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, the toast of the idiots. I think it's just uh, he, he he loved one one thing that I think has become lost, uh, taking part in various things here and there. Uh, I won't go any more into that. But one thing that I think has been lost is I see so much humor in Gurdjieff mm-hmm. in himself, yeah, yeah. in his writing. And sometimes even reading the tales, people read it just as this sort of monotonous da, 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 da. like it's, and it's like, no, this is a fun. This is a hilarious story. This is the devil. <laughs> really I mean, this, this is Beelzebub. Yeah. Like people sort of lose sight of that. This is Beelzebub on a spaceship telling <laughs> right. humanity that he's got like, instance, to give yeah. one example is at one point he's telling humanity that whenever women are menstruating they should all be locked up in a room together for four days right and it's like and people are like mm, i wonder what this means it's like it's a joke right it's a joke right right and right, Ger- right. You know, Gerjef, Gerjef at that point is clearly like you know he loved basically like how far yeah. can i how, how much can i jab this person until they're gonna yell but then you get all these. Yeah, well, that was a, that was a mean? thing he would do when he met people. Yeah. He would yeah. when he met people, wouldn't he? Sort of, he would try to find something they were vulnerable or sensitive about, and really kind of tweak that. Which to me is just busting balls, right? I like, think. <laughs> um, yeah, I think. I think like any good spiritual teacher, actually, he was very fair. So much like, and there's a book I really want to read, but it's so expensive uh, on Gurdjieff and Crowley. Mm-hmm. But Crowley's an example. Rudolf Steiner is an example. But most spiritual teachers are an example of if you're just like a civilian or someone who's like just meeting them and they're like, Oh, is that what you do? Okay, cool. I'm not really into that, but fine. They're just going to be, mm. they're going to teach. They're just going to be like, he'll be nice. He'll be friendly to you. Like he was with mm. Uh, mm. the workers who came to work on the Priory. But I think as soon as mm. you say, look, yeah, I, I really want to take this seriously. I really want to do the work. It's like, boom, right. You know, and that, that from that point on, right. yeah. What, what he called treading on people's corns you know they said that he was was that was his favorite thing to do which was you know the corn is that thing inside each of us the one thing where when someone presses on it or treads on it you know we we have we have an uh, uh, just an unavoidable reaction and it's something yeah. in us might be pride might be vanity might be some very specific thing self-justifying complaining but Gurdjieff, you know he would very quickly be like, all right i gotta find this person's corn and i got so for instance to go back to de hartman you know, one of the first things so De Hartman sort of says, oh, yeah, I think De Hartman would have been at Spencer's talks. And then he said, oh, you get to meet, you should meet Gurdjieff, right? And I think, so Gurdjieff would have known De Hartman, as you said, uh, the the uh, c- conductor for the orchestra of the Tsar, very high society, what we'd consider maybe even lower upper class or definitely higher middle class, very, very well to do. And where does Gurdjieff first decide to meet De Hartman? In the most bustling bazaar, filled to the brim with smoke, prostitutes, and alcohol, and you know he's saying, "You go come here, right?" And he's like, "That's that really is for De Hartman the first effort that he's got to make is you're right. staring point blank 
you know, in the face of your own pride, in your face of your own, like, oh, no, I, I can't do that. And then what's like the right. first task uh, Jeff gives to Hartman? He says, yeah, you know, I really need you to go sell these rugs. And it's in like the <laughs> it's in like the poorest part of the town, and he's like, you probably shouldn't do it in your suit. I think so. Department's sort of like trying to sell, basically, sell these rugs to just, you know, uh, and it's equivalent today of I guess like a sort of, um, you know, a, a politician, and then suddenly, yeah, can you go down to, you know, the working class area and just I don't know, work in a chip shop or something. Mm. I, yes. I love that because there's a lot of talk in like the self-help community now of like uh, going outside your comfort zone. And usually what they mean by that is like, uh, I don't even know. It's a pretty low level example. It's like they you know, generally, as far as I understand, what most people mean by going outside of your comfort zone is doing something you've always wanted to do that makes you a bit anxious. Yeah. Right? So people are like, you yeah, go right. on a bungee yep. jump. That's, that's not that's nothing yeah. to do with your comfort zone. That's like no, extra right. comfort, right? You're super enjoy or yeah. like, you know, yeah. or. Yeah, I'm going to travel the world. It's out of my comfort zone. That's not your comfort zone. You need to, right, you know, right. your, out of your comfort zone is looking horribly it's, internally and realizing something about, right. about yourself. You, and it's a little you know, different for everybody. Everybody's got their own, right? Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. And yeah. It, it, it's very interesting. You could go into, you know, you're this person who's setting out on this work. And, and, and so you th- maybe think you've already developed somewhere along this track and, you know, you start to meet Gurdjieff and the, the first thing he does is just makes you wildly uncomfortable in your own skin. That's, mm. that's, a, that's, a, that's, po- that's, <laughs> I can see why that would work. Well, and um, this is at the yeah. heart of his entire system, which was about setting a balance between these different centers in a person. And so uh, I don't have the specific example, but one thing I recall when I was first learning about him is that if you would show up at the Priory at the Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man, and you were an intellectual from Paris or from London or what, whatever, he would set you to digging a ditch or something comparable. He would put you to work in the kitchen, mm. right? And you would, you would have to earn your way into the lectures that way. Uh, he would exhaust yeah. these intellectuals and then bring them into the, to the lectures. Mm. Uh, and there's something to be said about that. And I think we can all benefit from maybe pausing and sitting in ourselves and thinking about where we're out of whack <laughs> yeah the, the strange thing with yeah. the centers i mean you know you have the emotional the physical and the intellectual being the main three really um is that all these intellectuals i mean i think for gurdjieff his most intellectual decisions are emotional you mm-hmm. just don't realize mm-hmm. it um and the yeah. centers are very peculiar because they work in ways that you don't realize i mean for instance i've heard it said and it's something that i agree with personally other people might disagree that the that talking the act of talking isn't intellectual or emotional it's primarily physical you sort of talk as a mm. physical habitual response da, 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 da. right you don't mm, think right. you don't you don't think you don't emote before you talk you just like but as a as a physical mm. uh response which is why so when you read the tales it's one of the reasons you read it out loud is because intellectually you're reading theoretically, emotionally, you're meant to read emotionally, but you think, well, it's a physical center. That's why you read it out loud. It's because it's engaging the physical center. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the yeah. podcast idiots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> uh, that, that's such a great point, man. I feel personally attacked. Mm. <laughs> well, it's one, of, it's one of the great, it's one of the horrible things about being a podcaster is that, uh, mm. At certain points, you can't often you can't just leave a gap, right? You can't just wait and think. Right. I'm just going to leave the time. You got to be yeah. like, blah, 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 I've got to keep this rolling. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah. Let oh, me yeah. fill this fill yeah. this space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. great. I'm going to leave. I'm at the end of this episode. I'm going to leave before we come back and do the After Dark Patreon, where we have some special uh, business. We're going to talk about Catherine Mansfield at the Priory and her death and everything uh, on the After Dark for the Patreon subscribers. Patreon.com/slash Art of Dark Pod. Support your your idiot podcast friends uh, if you like what we do uh please please visit that and you'll get an extra episode uh for every episode that we do um yeah that's interesting yeah i'm gonna leave 15 seconds of dead air at the end of this just so you hear how it feels right I'm fine. I'm fine <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, talk ab- <laughs> yeah talk about comfort zone yeah yeah yeah, yeah very cool uh one thing i kind of wanted to uh, you know i was listening to some some Gurdjieff stuff this past mm. week, um, just kind of refamiliarizing myself with with him and his ideas and things. And uh, I started really thinking about this matter. He would describe people as being both asleep and as being machines. 
Mm. And then I started to think about that in the historical context in which he was living, which it made me wonder if this notion of... To, for people now to say people are like machines or people are like becoming more and more like computers, I don't even think it's that radical of a thing to say anymore. But, but I, I have to imagine that when Gurdjieff told people that they were machines a hundred years ago, that that might have been a little bit more of a radical thing to say. And, and now I wonder, are we becoming more machine-like? Does, mm. it, fe- does it feel like? Does, he was calling that, people NP, NPCs before, <laughs> long before yeah. Yeah. the bird website came along. It's yeah. a good question. I don't think it's possible to be more asleep, in a way, okay. right? Once you're, once you're on the lower levels of being, once you're asleep, you're asleep. I mean, you you could be in a deeper sleep in a certain sense. I mean, I certainly feel more asleep when I'm on the computer looking at the screen than I do. Uh, walking around but you know uh, most of life when you're asleep is basically the equivalent of teleportation to be honest Uh, though people Mm -hmm. don't want to people don't want to admit to this yeah I think I think I don't think it would have been specifically new I think the idea since really the industrial revolution of tools and technology and man becoming this sort of synthesized thing is definitely um, it's definitely in the air the idea of a machine i mean how gurdjieff means machine is is a peculiar a peculiar thing um i think really sleep works better and the idea of waking up and what it is to be awake right um but yeah i mean that was it's certainly a shock to most people and if you can't accept it then you can't accept it it's the um, the pessimistic mm-hmm. side of gurdjieff's works and it's not for everyone but Mm. James, are you familiar with the uh, E.J. Gold writing? That's the <laughs> yeah. I have one of his books, but I never. I, I realized it was his, and then and I never read it because. Mm. Are you uh, not a not a fan? Well, I don't. I don't know much about it. All I know is that he tried to sort of do almost like a satire of Gurdjieff's stuff and write his own stuff off the bat. Yeah, he did. Yeah, I I, I do think there's one, especially for somebody who maybe uh, doesn't want to initially brave a Spensky or much less Beelzebub's tales to, to his grandson, a good, rather simple uh, sort of um, explication of Gurdjieff's theory is in a book called The Human Biological Machine as a Transformational Apparatus. It's easy to read, short chapters, pretty straight ahead. He's got a funky style of his own, and it, it pretty much summarizes the Gurdjieff work in a way that's a little more um, possibly accessible to people. I think if you, if you got that and you got the DeHartman biography, that would be a good entree possibly um, Mm. into the work. Mm. He also has a book on true prayer, calls it the hidden work. Uh, And he talks about what real prayer is, uh, which, which I think is interesting. But again, there's just, I mean, must be like a thousand books that follow on Gurdjieff and his life. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a little interesting. Mm, I would advise people not to get caught up in Gurdjieff himself, uh, despite the fact that a lot of post-death Gurdjieff stuff has said that they've tried to not get caught up in the myth. Because when, you know, this, this, this whole thing of after Gurdjieff's death of him becoming this myth, it's very, very clear that in his lifetime, he was fierce about, that not being a gossipy thing and not having people buy into that. Um, I think at one point, uh, the doctor, who I can't remember his name, but he wrote a book called My Father Gurdjieff or something like that. You know, he sort of alludes to Gurdjieff as like almost the second coming and Gurdjieff really, really mm. rips into him. I um, mean, anyone mm. who uh, was ultimately a brown noser with Gurdjieff, he would not stand for this. Um, yeah. I, so I tend to find like, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, after you, Brad, I'll ask after you. Oh, yeah. So I, this was the thing that I, I like that about him kind of coming to understand that aspect of him. And I think it's easy to dismiss some of this, the, the, the culture around him um, and, and him himself. It's easy to dismiss this as, well, I'll just say it. So there are aspects in which the whole Gurdjieff sort of movement has some of the same attributes as a cult. I think mm. that's fair to say. Well, that's right? where that's where it's Gurdjieffian and no longer the work. Because I think Gurdjieff understands right. the work isn't actually the the work about is him. A, it's a longer, bigger thing, uh, mm-hmm. and that's why it's almost like just be careful of getting caught up in the myth. Yeah, 
Right, right. And I think this is what actually distinct one, one of many distinguishing characteristics of this whole thing is the the sort of the leader at the center of it isn't trying to aggrandize himself, isn't trying to make himself mm. mythologize himself, turn himself into a saint. Whereas if you, you know, look around it, there's always, there's a thousand cults in existence right now. There's always somebody at the center of it who is mm. making it more and more about themselves all of the time. Mm. Well, all right, yeah. th- this is a big thing as well, because on the one hand, to define the Gurdjieff work as a as a cult is is wrong because the the, the, the very the key mm-hmm. characteristics of a cult are generally severing severing connections with family and friends and saying this is the only way you can't leave uh, and everything we say you have to absolutely believe okay and what's the first thing Gurdjieff tells anyone don't believe anything I say prove it for yourself <laughs> right you know right, right. Uh, and you're absolutely free to there, there is no there's no building there's no there's no church, there's no anything like that, right? It's an internal work. Mm. Um, but with this idea of the leader, I mean, this is something that I've become very pe- pe- pessimistic about uh, in recent years, about this idea of actually every now and again, someone like Rudolf Steiner, someone like Gurdjieff, someone like Blavatsky, someone who, let's could say, o- could can open themselves more than most people, uh, we can get to whether or not I think Gurdjieff's actually human in a bit. Um, <laughs> Oh, okay. oh boy. That's a good question. Okay. That's a good point. Um, but every now and again, someone like this comes along and there's, there's this sort of unspoken idea that, oh, we'll just continue it. And it's like, that doesn't happen. And actually, Gurdjieff's one of the few who, there's this picture of Gurdjieff, the last picture of him ever taken, other than the death photo, obviously, where he sat on a bench, slumped over with this. It's my favorite photo of him with this sort of look as if to say, you know, his whole thing has failed. And I think in a way, I think in a way he understood that it was a failure because he didn't do enough prep to really make it clear what's to happen afterwards. And he's, you know, his last words mm-hmm. supposedly were, I've left you all a big mess. And for the people who read into Uspensky's life, who died only a few years prior, he about a week or no, it could have been a month or a few weeks before his own death, he got all the major members of his work groups together and he said, I'm done with the work. You all need to do your own thing. And then in the writings of Rodney Collin, who I'm really fond of, his last, some of his last chats with Uspensky, Uspensky says to him, your job is just to start the whole thing again, but you do it. So you're not following on. You mm. sort of recreate it in your own terms for this time, for this context. Because Gurdjieff's all about that. He said, I wrote Beelzebub's Tales for this context. And I honestly almost think maybe it's already out of date because the modern world's been moving so fast. Right. He's saying, I'm writing a holy book for you guys to understand in your language. Well, maybe it's already out of date because everything's moving faster and right. faster and faster. Um, right. Right. And so uh, this idea of the leader, it's like it's it's a bit false because it's almost like you're hanging on to something which is already it died a long time ago. Like Gurdjieff died. It's like you now need to move and develop your own thing and have the courage to do that. I mean, of course, there has to be a point when you're in a certain sense qualified to do that. But I think a lot of that qualification is the mm-hmm. courage the courage to do that Um, and so you know after Gurdjieff's death you really you do see it fragment into just so many different they all seem the same but they're really not Araj was really intellectual Uh, Morris Nichol really adhered to the Christian aspect Uh, de Salzman was more about the movements and actually there's a key difference between de Salzman's and Gurdjieff's way of uh, sort of form of prayer and many many things Um, yeah so the leader is it's comparable it's comparable, uh, comparable to something like a martial art where everybody traces their lineage, not just to Gurdjieff directly, but mm. through, oh, more Ospensky or more Nickel or more, you know. Yeah, yeah. but I'd, you definitely, if you really do get interested in the work, you do have to meet people of the lineage. It will change it for you. Mm. Mm. Well, and you mentioned Morris Nickel, which mm. is someone who I'm not familiar with. So you You're mentioned not familiar he- with Nickel? No, I'm not. So this is a, a bit of a, a gap for me. I'm, have, I'm you heard, have you have you have you heard of, have you heard yes. of him? Believe it or not, I hadn't. No. Okay. Mm. Well, Nichols Nichols an amazing character. Um, mm. So Nichol was originally one of the first proper students of Jung, Carl Jung, uh, and he was actually mm. the godfather to Carl Jung's uh, children. I mean, that's how well they got on. And Nichol got to about 28, and he met Uspensky via Kenneth Walker, and Nichol said, "Yeah, this is the truth," and he just gave up everything. 
and went to the priory wow. and he it was his job to be the kitchen boy and wash dishes for about uh i think it was about a year and a half every day wash dishes with no hot water and no soap and you know a few months prior he was like one of the most well-known Jungian psychoanal- psychoanalysts and psychologists in the country and now he's wow. washing dishes for Gurdjieff and he went and wrote he wrote basically some of the best works on Gurdjieff called uh, Psychological Commentaries on Gurdjieff and Uspensky. It's five volumes. And then he wrote some, th- he wrote many, many other books and they're all absolutely fantastic. I think he's one of the greatest spiritual teachers. Um, yeah. Mm. Who really came from that tradition, but he really, he went out on his own um, in a certain sense. Uh, Uspensky after it all sort of crumbled, you know, Gurdjieff said, go teach and do it. And he just did his own thing and he never actually went back and saw Gurdjieff. So I feel he was the, so with, with Araj, with the Hartman and with many other students, they had a real trouble separating themselves from the teacher, from Gurdjieff. They, they, Gurdjieff with the de Hartmans, he said, like, unless you leave, you can never play my music again. And with Araj, he had to be really cruel to him. And mm. Nickel is peculiarly the one that learned the lessons. And I think he learned this and he understood and just went. And he actually, ne- other than the funeral, he never went back and saw Gurdjieff. Which is like, oh, wow. it's amazing to me because like you met someone like Gurdjieff, you never went and just like saw him, right. you know? But yeah. I think he was like, yeah. Yeah and, no. from, yeah, and from the exterior, that could seem like bad blood or something, but to, but it's but it's not. No, no, yeah, no, no. interesting. Mm. I, I want to talk about a little bit. Uh, there's uh, one question I've got based on something you said, but there's something I want to make sure we kind of talk <laughs> about because you've also been doing... Um, on Hermetics or part of the Hermetics project, you have been doing a chapter by chapter look at meditations on the Mm. tarot, Mm -hmm. which is a book I've read twice. And so I now officially understand like 10% (laughs) of it or something. Uh, And, and so I've been listening to that and, and I don't know if I have a question, but maybe let's start here is what do you see? Is there some overlap between what you getting you get out of that work, Meditations on the Tarot, A Journey into Christian Hermeticism, and and Gurdjieff? Is there something there for you? There's less practice in Meditations on the Tarot. And that was the thing that drew me to Gurdjieff mm-hmm. was really he's like, just start practicing, start doing things. And you know, the, the mm-hmm. things that he gives you to do will last you a lifetime. There's an overlap because um, Valentin Tomberg, who wrote Meditations on the Tarot, um, he mentions Gurdjieff a lot. So he was clearly very, very well read in spiritual circles, like exceedingly well read because I think he published that in the seventies, first published in seventies in France. And the Gurdjieff stuff wouldn't really be all that well known at that point. I don't think, you know, to get your hands on it, you must've gone deep and, and he has a thorough look and he has great criticism of Gurdjieff that I'm in agreement with. It's what I've found, which is Gurdjieffians don't know how to cry. They become Mm. very, uh, Mm. you know, back straight, uh, protected from the world, finding ways to, Mm. to shell off a lot. They become weird shells. Um, (laughs) so yeah, that's his, uh, that's his criticism. (laughs) Not all of them, not all of them, but, um, that's his criticism and it's what I found to be true as well. And so there's an overlap, but that's very good for understanding the, the, the overarching thing as to what's going on and symbolism as well. Yeah. It's very enjoyable book. Yeah. Oh man, it's something else. I'll read it. I'll be reading it again. Uh, yeah, yeah. The friend who helped me turn uh, helped turn me on to Gurdjieff many many years ago is also an adult convert to Catholicism now, uh, which is so kind is of... so is J G Bennett, so is Catherine Holm, mm. so is uh, mm-hmm. Rodney Collin. Mm. So and all these people. possibly this comes from Colin. Possibly Uspensky went that way in the mm. end. I just well, it's it easy because it's the one true faith. <laughs> <laughs> which we right like there to say. The, right, there it's the, it. it's right there in the creeds. If only people would just read that line. If, if only you would just listen. <laughs> That's like an ongoing, uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, we are, yeah. You're talking to a couple yeah. of cradle, cradle Catholics. So yeah. Um, yeah. I do. I yeah. admire people who, who come to it as adults. Go, go ahead, Brad. Yeah, well, uh, I guess the, the other question, because we're, we're coming up on our hour here in a little mm. bit, um, you sort of slyly mentioned uh, that you had some thoughts on whether Gurdjieff was a human, I think is how you described it. And so mm. I can't help but pull that thread. Wow. What, what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> I've read a lot. <laughs> like I've read a lot of Gurdjieff books and I, I am fascinated with the man himself. And the mm-hmm. thing that a couple of them have sort of stated uh, that doesn't really come through in them all is a lot of people said that they felt really that they were stood 
stood with someone who was more than human or was in some sense she was stood with a very pleasant alien and really okay so so it's really in my mind whether or not Gurdjieff is an angel or a demon like quite literally um because so just to give some 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 context it it is widely reported by pretty much everyone who well everyone who stayed at the priory during that time that Gurdjieff was the last to go to bed every night and the first to get up which if you look at the schedules of people at the priory meant he was going on one to two hours sleep a night for however many years they were there plus doing everything that he was doing there's also um if you look through Fritz Peter's books and oh, what was the one I went, read recently? I can't remember. There is multiple miracles assigned to Gurdjieff. He mm. healed uh, Michel de Salzman's, uh, he had a form of lung cancer, which he healed. He mm. healed someone who had like this burnt, they burnt their hand in a fire and he put their hand back in the fire and it came out healed and very, very strange things. And basically all led well, me arguably to he, yeah. Ar- Arguably, he healed himself after his car accident, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a funny story about that, I actually. Mean, uh, I don't know if you've heard it. Yeah. The, um, when he had the car accident, um, they knew digestion was a very important part for him, thing for him. Right? So he had this car accident. He went into a coma. They, uh, they said that we want him back in the priory where he's going to heal. And they were like, well, what, what do we do about like digestion? It's a super important thing for Gurdjieff. So they, they started giving him enemas, right? Oh. And they gave him like three days of enemas. And then on the fourth day, I think it was, the first time he'd woken up since the accident, he woke up for like five seconds, literally to say, no more enemas. And then fell back asleep. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like sort of no, healed sorry, himself. I interrupted you with that. No, it's fine. Yeah. A, and then, yeah, he sort of healed himself, uh, as you say. And he also had this weird energy transference thing to someone at some point. And lots of uh, just, just stuff that you think, how, like how, how did this... And, 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 you know, of reading all these Gurdjieff books, there's only like two books he's ever cited of actually reading. So it's like, well, right. where, does this all, where does this all come from? And he never, right. he never seems to spend any time reading. You know, right. he all he right. says because he knows of Uspensky and they ask about Tertium Organum Morgana moods and Uspensky's books and they ask Gurdjieff, well, what do you think about Tertium Morgana? And he just says, ah, very intellectual. You know, it, it's, <laughs> it's basically like the knowledge is coming from somewhere else. So right. yeah. it's, um, it's a peculiar thing. I just, and I think that's why the emulation of Gurdjieff and the imitation of him is very dangerous because it's like, no, 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 he's just, he's not, he's, I don't think, I don't think you could become like him. I, don't, I think that's a very dangerous thing to try to do because he's from, yeah, peculiar man, peculiar man. Yeah, very yeah, interesting. Absolutely. Well, there was a, Kevin, when we did our original episode, you read a passage about him that somebody was describing him and they described his eyes as changing colors. Like over the, not rapidly, but like over the mm. course of a day, his eyes might change color. Yeah, everyone mentions um, his eyes. Everyone mentions his eyes. Yeah. Which, which from a black and white photo are compelling. You know, they mm. feel like they're staring through you, even in a you know, hundred year old photo. The big mustache, probably the greatest mustache mm. of the 20th century. Mm. Uh, just, uh, just extraordinary. Yeah. Him and maybe Dolly, you know, mm. think about that. Yeah. Yeah. He's, it's worth looking up pictures of him. Uh, James, what do you make of his meeting with Crowley? Uh, I, don't make, I don't make too much of it really the funniest thing that came from that is the fact that I believe Crowley meets Gurdjieff actually before he meets Gurdjieff so he meets Gurdjieff and Gurdjieff's just sort of larping as a gardener and, he's, and he says Uh-oh. well where's Gurdjieff? Gurdjieff says he's in there and then he goes in and then they say that's Gurdjieff so he sort of couldn't <laughs> notice it was good and then there's some weird stuff about Crowley being all weird and but that's all from the yeah. Gurdjieff side if you read the mm-hmm. Crowley side of things uh they actually say that he stayed there for like a week and it was fairly all right i don't know what the truth is i can't imagine gurdjieff getting on with crowley uh i think that's two sides two sides of magic going on there black magic and white magic and different temperaments as well i mean yeah i just cannot Mm. see him getting on i just think it's such a funny idea (laughs) it's just so high contrast and and unusual yeah yeah Mm. Mm. 
<clears throat> well, um, I, you know, I maybe we can close with this. So, um, I, for a long time, I've wanted to ask you, James, mm -hmm. the Hermetics question, <laughs> which is, and maybe we just throw Gurdjieff in this okay. mix, Gurdjieff but which is, there. you know, yeah, okay, okay, I figured he probably was. So, if you could have dinner with any three people, living or dead, assume hmm. that they can all speak the same language for the course of this dinner. Who would you, who would you bring to the table? I mean, it's it's tough, right? Because Gurdjieff's already there, and as you guys know, like there is there's not many people who are gonna like. I'm just gonna be focusing on Gurdjieff and what he makes of me. I'm gonna right. be pretty. I'll be pretty. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. I'm gonna be pretty fucking terrified. You know, you're gonna be right. <laughs> but, but I think, but ultimately, yeah. from what I understand of Gurdjieff, he would know that, and he'd play play in some certain sense up to whatever my expectations are. So I always think, because I have high expectations of meeting Gurdjieff, I'd probably want to be one of those people who meets him, and I'm like, huh. That it, yeah. you know, he, he'd, <laughs> he'd make it. Yeah. Um, yeah. As for the other three, um, Ernst Jünger would be one. Um, and I believe I, yeah. I don't have it on any authority, but I'm fairly sure they met because Jünger mentioned okay. Gurdjieff in two of his books. Jünger was in Paris during the World War II. So was Gurdjieff. Jünger was into meeting, you know, the interesting people. They, they would have met at some point. And uh, he sort of, dis he right. describes Gurdjieff at one point as this strange man from the Caucasus, you know, and it comes across as like, yeah, he met him. Mm -hmm. um, and then it would be St. Edith Stein, who was my confirmation saint. But then at the same time, I think about that and I think now I've got a saint in the room, you know, I'm like, blind. <laughs> Gurdjieff and a saint, right? You know, my best behavior. It'd be nice to yeah. see what, like, yeah. someone who, Many Catholics might consider Gurdjieff, you know, oh, this weird spiritual figure, very heretical. It'd be nice to see what mm -hmm. a saint can, you know, nice to see them chat. Um, mm -hmm. And then as for another one, I mean, that's a really difficult, that's a difficult one, to be honest. Because, because mainly because you've already got, maybe it'd be like N Nazruddin, right? Like someone who Gurdjieff really highly respects, uh, Mullah okay. Nazruddin. Okay. You know, just this okay. weird sort of donkey riding wise man uh someone like that maybe <laughs> okay um, okay but once you've got someone like Gurdjieff in the room that it's not a normal conversation anymore right? the dynamics no yeah yeah no I, I could I could definitely see that yeah mm. well we're gonna want to come back and do another 30 minutes on the after dark for patreon subscribers please support the podcast uh, please if you're not uh, already a fan go listen to hermetics support uh, James show. He's doing great work. Brad, Brad's a big fan. I've been listening to episodes. I listened to a couple of his, he, he has a couple of episodes on Gurdjieff. Uh, we, we do like to end with a classic art of darkness, uh, podcast question, which is what do you think James, what would Gurdjieff be doing now? If he was still around, what do you think it would look like? Uh, I asked this question to, one of the last people alive who well, was with Gurdjieff at the Priory, who's still around. Uh, and they said he'd love it because he'd love the modern world because there's even more fuel for you to work against, right? There's even more distractions. Oh. Uh, my, uh, my idea though is I wonder if he'd have turned into one of those modern mystics who actually got quite bowled over by television and would mm -hmm. he become... Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe like a TV might, personality. Yeah, might might the work have been cheapened by Gurdjieff's fascination with those sorts of things. He famously famous well, infamously, he never spoke on the telephone. So I don't know about that. But it's weird to think of him out of the context that he was within because because it's a very personal thing, because you had to go meet him. And because in those days, you know, to, to travel from the UK to go meet him or so, it is a journey. You know, you're doing this by Mm -hmm. or to travel to meet him is a real a lot of the time would have been a real struggle whereas now it's like oh, i'm gonna go see gurdjieff i just get on a flight for an hour and then get an uber yeah, to the prior yeah Ryan, yeah filming right, gurdjieff right. with a smartphone getting a yeah. selfie with him or something i just can't <laughs> yeah. so i wonder if he would have become a very secretive you know only a few like way more secretive sort of thing i don't know it's right i can't think of him yeah he was hard enough he was hard enough to get to at that time. So now, yeah, no, I think that makes sense. I, I think our definition of sort of like esoteric knowledge now is like, yeah, it's not in the first five hits on Google. So if it's past that, it's, it's esoteric knowledge, <laughs> right? Whereas, you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's like the third you, yeah, link you on it. YouTube. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So no, that, I, I think he, that sounds right to me that he would have gotten 
kind of more secretive, more hidden, but still doing the same. You know, I like. I like to think he might be very online with a milady NFT, as in an anon. <laughs> just yeah. Oh, rip. That, they, see, that's an idea that not milady NFT, but he's just a Twitter account, mm. and it's like yeah. completely one of those ones. Yeah. No yeah. profile picture. The, the automatic right. name that's given, like Anon, yeah. you know, Anon seven 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 one three, right? But right. but like right. he's tweeting literally the hidden secrets yeah. of the universe, right? 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 And there's like fifty 2, people follow, followers. 50, yeah. yeah, he's got like a patron, <laughs> like twenty patrons or something. <laughs> well, let's come back. Let's come back and talk about Catherine Mansfield and her death at the Priory, and some more business about Gurdjieff yeah. with the great James LS James. Where can people find you uh, online? Uh, hermetics, uh, dot net and then meta underscore nomad on Twitter is the best yeah. places. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, well, well thank you well, so well, much for coming that. on. I really, I really, yeah. yeah, I'll put those in the show notes. I really enjoyed this. And now let's sit in silence for 15 seconds to see how it feels before we come back. doing the work mm. <laughs> all right fellas thanks again we'll come back in five minutes on the after dark peace all right